Buying a new car is a highly personal experience. It's not only likely the highest ticket item you'll buy outside of a house, but it's something that you're going to hopefully own for a number of years. It's going to get you to and from work. It's going to help you explore the world. It'll help you carry out errands and it might even change your world for the better. And they're also a personal extension of yourself from the color you choose to the drive chain choices, the features package, and of course, your decision to add bumper stickers or a custom plate as I am wont to do, cars are our own automotive equivalent of an online avatar. Through our reviews on this channel, we let you know what we think of new car models on the market today. Our in-depth analysis helps you to understand new features coming to market. And recently, I've told you why, in today's high demand market, that you might not want to be buying a new electric car, or in fact, a new car, period. And if you haven't seen those videos, do follow the links below as I think they're still very useful to watch. But what if you are in the market for a new electric car right now, despite how wild the market is, be it a brand new car or a new to you used car? What things should you look for in a new to you EV? And what are going to be killer features that you will be glad you got when you sell your car that will ensure you get the highest possible sticker price for it? I'll tell you in a moment, but first, don't watch that, watch this. This is the heavy, heavy TE show, the eviest show around. So if you've come in off the street and you're beginning to feel the heat, well, listen, Buster, you'd best hit subscribe and ding the bell to the rockiest rock solid videos of Transport Evolved. No, no, don't worry. I, I haven't got my horn with me, but seriously, subscribe, ding the bell and stick around until the end to keep us producing our mixture of sarcasm, wit and fact, plus the occasional butchered 1980s song. Since many of our must have features relate to charging, we're going to throw them all in together. And first, let's start with charging speed. A lot of people will tell you to buy the EV with the longest range per charge. And while we did think about adding that to our list of requirements. We decided not to, because honestly, buying the longest range EV may add unnecessary cost that you don't need. But having at least 150 kilowatts DC quick charging capability, that's frankly a must have. When your car charges at 150 kilowatts or higher, your stops should be reasonably quick. A few years ago, 50 kilowatts DC quick charging was seen as pretty expeditious, but these days, anything less than 150 kilowatts DT quick charging is... it's a bit slow. I own not one, but two EVs that max out at a theoretical 55 kilowatts, two 2017 Chevrolet Bolt EVs. And when I'm on a road trip, recharging can take 40 to 45 minutes pass for a 10 to 80% rapid charge. My partner and I just get on with it when we're doing a long distance road trip together and we're happy to put up with it because of the savings compared to gasoline. But most people who road trip are going to want cars that charge far more quickly. Even if you're okay with a slower charge time for a lower sticker price, personally, you may want to consider investing in a higher speed charging capability so that when you do sell your car on, it's more desirable to other people. Although do be wary of cars that have a high theoretical maximum, but can only hold that for a really short period of time. While Toyota's BZ4X EV can theoretically manage 100 kilowatts on paper, it's quickly gained a reputation for failing to even get near that in practice. Higher charge rates do of course result in less time on the road. So the higher the better, both from convenience and resale value. 150 kilowatts DC quick charging does seem to be a good starting point. Most modern charging stations support at least that as a power transfer. And in my experience, a car like a Ford Mustang Mach-E GT with just shy of 100 kilowatt hours of battery on board can charge almost as quickly as a Tesla Model 3 long range rear wheel drive on the road. And when I say almost, I mean that when you drive both cars on the same route over the course of a day, we were finding that even though they left at the same time in the morning, the Mustang Mark E GT was only 10 to 15 minutes behind the Tesla at the end of the day. Compare that to say my Chevrolet Bolt EVs, which would have been 
literally hours behind the Tesla. Closely following in from charging speed is the ability to precondition your battery pack so that when you do arrive at a charging station, your car can accept the absolute highest power transfer rate it can. And of course, on the flip side of that, we think it's important to avoid cars that restrict charging speed because of temperature. Nissan Leaf, I'm looking at you. It's generally accepted now that while extremes of temperature can cause damage to an electric car battery pack, careful preconditioning of the pack, warming it prior to rapid charging and then cooling it down in a controlled manner after, can improve charge times. While not all electric vehicles do this, many mid to higher end models now have the ability to let you tell your car you're heading to a rapid charging station. This is usually done by setting a high power charging station as a destination or waypoint in your sat nav. And when you do that, the car will automatically get the battery pack up to a warmer temperature that's better suited to accepting high power DC quick charging. Having a pack that is at optimum temperature for DC quick charging can dramatically reduce charge times and can improve overall battery health. While some EVs are shipping with it out of the factory, other EVs are promising it in future via an over-the-air update, but we'll come to that bit a little later on. Like charging speed, this is totally a convenience feature that will save you time, but it will also dramatically improve the retail value of your car in the future, especially as more first-time EV buyers come into the market. Which brings me to the third part of the charging trio of must-haves, or at least a very nice to have, plug and charge. Being able to rock up at a rapid charging station and simply plug in and walk away is one of those time-saving perks that comes from having an EV with plug and charge. Again, not every EV comes from the factory with it, but many current EVs fitted with the relevant hardware are getting plug and charge via software updates after sale. Be aware though, some cars currently on sale don't have the required hardware and no amount of software magic will make this feature appear if the physical bits aren't there. And not all rapid charging stations have plug and charge, so it's always a good idea to check stations you're likely to use before paying extra to have it. But again, we think it's quickly becoming an expected feature. Plug and charge basically takes care of all of the payment for you, so you don't have to use a smartphone app or even a credit card to authenticate payment. And it's so much easier to use than faffing around with credit cards or smartphone apps. And when it does work, it dramatically reduces the amount of time you spend getting ready to charge your car. But, and this is a massive but, in my experience, plug-in charge can cost you more. Take Ford's Blue Oval charging system, which includes plug-in charge. While it is convenient and lets you plug in without dealing with payment on a cold, wet night in the middle of nowhere, charging at an Electrify America, for example, using Blue Oval and plug-in charge can cost upwards of 11 cents more per kilowatt hour than it would be if you just had a regular membership with Electrify America and a $4 a month membership, and you just manually activated to start each session. That all might not seem like much more expense, but I recently did some calculations because, you know, I'm about to buy a truck with a 131 kilowatt hour battery pack. And basically in one charging session, let's say we put 110 kilowatt hours into the battery pack, I'd look to save around $13.20 in one charging session, enough to pay for the $4 Electrify America monthly membership fee and have money left over for coffee if I opted to do it manually rather than use Ford's Blue Oval just so I could use plug and charge. That said, people are willing to pay for convenience and for those making the transition from gasoline to electric, the ability to just rock up and auto magically authenticate is a big deal. So even if you don't use it, having a car with plug and charge is a killer bonus for retail value. I've given you three big charging must-haves, so now let's give you something else. An onboard inverter. 
Onboard inverters, be they vehicle-to-load systems, as found in cars like the Kia EV6, or full-blown vehicle-to-home systems, as made possible by the Ford F-150 Lightning, are big killer features for new EVs. Not only do they make it possible to use your vehicle to power household appliances when you're on the road, or maybe camping, but they can also help make unexpected power cuts or brownouts a whole lot more bearable in today's modern world. Especially if you have kids who like to use the internet. Of course, where you live may impact how important this feature is to you. If you live in Texas, for example, it's probably a super important must-have feature, but if you live in a large city that has a modern, reliable electrical grid and few natural disaster risks, you may not feel that this is worth the extra spend. But again, this is a feature that we all think is going to be a must-have in the future, especially for vehicles where it may have been an optional extra. So think of vehicle to load or vehicle to home as being the modern equivalent of heated seats in those early EVs. A great convenience feature that you probably didn't think you'd use all that much, but after living with it for a while, you can't imagine life without it. Our final must-have for new EV purchases it's not range, nor is it acceleration, or indeed semi-autonomous driver assistance features. It's over-the-air software update capability. Modern EVs are essentially just computers on wheels, and thanks to that, there are a huge number of automakers following Tesla's EV lead on OTA and rolling out regular feature updates to customers' cars long after they leave the factory, be it a new charging curve to slash rapid charge times, new in-car entertainment options, dash cam functionality using existing vehicle cameras, or a must-have bug fix that would have otherwise required you to visit the dealer and take time off work. OTA allows you to ensure that your vehicle remains as current as possible. While I personally don't own a vehicle yet with over-the-air updates, I do have one on order, obviously, those who I know who do say that for the most part, OTA updates are a real blessing. They save you time and it helps to make sure that you're not left behind by the competition or in fact the new shiny. But a warning, as Tesla proved not so long ago, sometimes over-the-air updates can alienate customers, especially if they have no choice about updating to something that is new and unusual. That said, for the most part, OTA functionality is going to improve your car's resale value, as it means anyone who buys it can hopefully benefit from the latest and greater that the automaker who made your car has to offer. So those are our recommendations. And before I sign off, I know a lot of you will ask about why we didn't include autonomous or semi-autonomous features in our must-have list. The reason? Well, right now, autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicle development is pretty heavily focused on rapid generational improvements in both hardware and software. We've already seen cars on sale today used that were once promised to have more advanced features than they actually ended up with. So if you do want the benefits of semi-autonomous systems, view them as something that might help you, and by all means go for it if that's the case. I've just ordered a truck with Blue Cruise. But also note that things will age or hinder your vehicle down the road. And until we've got to a point where autonomous vehicle capabilities are mainly software driven rather than hardware constrained, I think these features may ultimately aid your car when it comes to sell it. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Or are we a bunch of fools who know nothing, Jon Snow? Let us know politely below. Well, that's it for today. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There are links in the description. And if you really liked today's video, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you do send our way goes towards helping us make great content. If you would like a generalized news roundup in the world of cleaner, greener, safer and smarter vehicles, do put our 10 news roundup show on your calendar every weekend. And don't forget, we produce videos every single day on this network for you to enjoy, ranging from deep dives and features through to tutorials, unboxings and reviews. And there's a big unboxing coming your way, if you get my drift.
If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolved Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Oh, and don't forget to fill out our annual viewer survey. It'll take about 20 minutes, but your answers really will help us better represent our audience, both to sponsors and partners of the channel, as well as make sure that we make content that you guys want us to make. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folk on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, it's Chris Maxwell, Pedro Miro Pinheiro, Patrick Boyaski, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, Dave Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leon, Andrew Martin, Guido Rahota, Brophy Wolf, Tazla in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ray Jean Fellows, Jim Burness, Chris Ascenter, Chris and Michael Johnson, Peter Dillinger and Denny Hyde, and our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month supporters. Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Rory Litwin, Joe Bresney, Reed R, JP Fagerback, Russ, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. If you'd like to be part of the amazing list, you can join Patreon at the link below, hit the join button to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Ko-fi, or our cool swag store. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching the video and sharing it really does make a difference to our ad revenue. Thanks for joining me and as always, keep evolving! <laughs>